Welcome to Layers with Larry. I'm Larry. These are all my layers. So this video, um, we're going to be talking about the way that things become fossilized. We'll go through uh, all six of the main methods of, of fossil preservation that apply to all of Larry's layers. So this is really not about a specific layer, but more about the, the process through which uh, living things can leave traces of themselves in, uh, in my layers. So petrification, what's that word? Where does that come from? Uh, from the Greek petros meaning uh, rock or stone. Uh, so petrification literally means something's been turned to stone. So the original material that was there either got dissolved away and totally replaced by something else, or some of the original material was there and parts of it got replaced. Wood and bone have within them um, lots of porosity, you know, lots of little spaces where normally there's fluids and blood and stuff like that. But when the animal dies and gets buried, those spaces are empty. And uh, over time, as that material gets buried deep in the earth, uh, minerals rich in materials like silica, for example, in the case of wood and bone, that's commonly what replaces them or petrifies them. Um, that silica precipitates out in the spaces of, of what here were actual individual cells, and here what were the individual little pores, some very small, some uh, larger, and eventually filled in those spaces with rock hard material, silica or quartz. Um, sometimes little bits of the original wood or bone may still be there, but over time, eventually even, even the, the cell walls or the, um, you know, the actual bony material can get dissolved away and replaced as well. All right, so let's talk a moment about um, uh, the idea of molds and casts. Uh, now, if you were to uh, you know, take your hand and surround it with, with clay or, and then pull the clay away, you would have a mold of your hand. And if I were to take some material like plaster of Paris or plastic material, pour it into that and let it harden and pull it away, I would have a cast that would look the same as my hand. Here's some examples from the Cody Shale. Um, here you can see the clearly impression of a shell, but the shell's not there. So this is preserving in the, in the hardened mud um, a perfect impression of what the outside of that uh, animal shell looked like. So if I, again, were to pour something in there to harden, pull it away, even though I don't have the original fossil, I could get all the information about that fossil from that impression. Okay, let's talk about that, uh, that third method of preservation I mentioned, carbonization. You know, we're all made out of carbon. Uh, you don't look like it. You don't look like a chunk of coal, but that's because the carbon atoms are joined to all kinds of other atoms, like hydrogen and, and oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur and phosphorus and all that good stuff. But if you're a, a, a plant and you get buried in sediment deep in the earth and that sediment is no longer exposed to oxygen, then your organic remains, which is the chemicals based on carbon I just mentioned, um, are not able to be eaten by microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, things like that. They need oxygen to do that. This is a piece of what you call mudstone or, or siltstone. And uh, around here, when the Paleocene was happening, there were lots of uh, rivers and streams and lakes and, and bogs and marshes and things like that. And in them, uh, leaves and bits of plants settled and eventually were covered and prevented from being destroyed. Uh, the carbon is, uh, is very hardy and it hangs on a long time. The oxygen, the, uh, the, the, uh, the hydrogen, the phosphorus, the sulfur, those sort of things went away. And what you're left with then is like a, a carbon film. In this case, when I split the rock, you can see how the carbon film actually only adhered to one side. So that's the actual original carbon of that leaf when it was alive. So the fourth example of uh, ways that things can be fossilized, or at least leave traces of themselves, when we don't actually have the bones or teeth or remnants of the actual fossil, they still can leave behind traces of their existence uh, and do what they did. Like in the case of this shorebird from the Green River Formation that walked over a, a muddy surface that was uh, slightly dry, but not hard, you know, it was soft enough to leave footprints in and eventually preserved it, evidence of its passing. Um, here, here is a uh, reptile track from Arizona. That's about 270 million years old. Uh, back in the Trattlebite video, if you watched that, you might remember this specimen that shows a variety of uh, burrows, of various worms, and little crustacean-y things, like shrimpy things, and, and, and traces of, um, of trilobites that leave behind these little nest marks called Rus ficus. There's a particularly nice one. In, in reality, it was actually upside down. The tried to bite, dug into the soft mud, made a nest. That got covered up by other sediment. Eventually, they separated cleanly at that point so that you could see the evidence of that creature's uh, uh, passing. 
So let, let's revisit the, um, the copper light for a minute. Um, if you watch the Wyoming uh, golfing uh, layers with Larry, uh, I mentioned this little object that you sure would recognize even if I hadn't told you about it. Um, but uh, other creatures leave behind traces of themselves. Uh, dinosaurs certainly do. And I don't have any dinosaur dung here, but it is found and, and it can be sliced open and looked under microscopes and polished and we can see the, you know, what bones of the creatures they ate or the bits of plants that they ate. Um, here's a, a kind of a cool example. You know, uh, Wyoming's famous for its fossil fishes. Uh, they come from the Green River Formation, which we don't have around here, but we have rocks of the same age. Uh, the Willwood Formation um, uh, in the Eocene about 50 million years ago, about the same age. But down in southeastern Wyoming, there were uh, big lake, inter, intermountain basin lakes, and a lot of oil shale formed there. And these are basically parts of the oil shale. These are freshwater deposits. Uh, these two examples are um, uh, the uh, state fossil fish, actually, called Nidea eoceana. Um, and they are preserved essentially as original bone material. Now, why are they being mentioned in the, this part about copper lights? Well, there's actually three fossils on this plate. Now, the two obvious ones, but if you look carefully here, and we'll show you a close-up, uh, that is kind of what it looks like. If you have aquariums and you've seen little <laughs> tubular looking things laying on the bottom of your tank, and they came out of the back end of your fish, that's because they are copper lights. So those are fish copper lights there. So the last, uh, last form of fossilization I wanted to mention was about original preservation. Um, that often relates to relatively newer types of things. So um, I mentioned that this one is an example of essentially original material. These uh, fossil fish are pretty much the original bone. That, that, that sort of gray or that brownish background, that's all fish scales. All the bones, scales are made of bone. Uh, they're like a bony armor plating um, on the fish, are preserved just ex exquisitely perfectly in that fine sediment. And again, uh, as you'd imagine from what I mentioned about carbonization, in this case there's really not carbon left anymore, but it's the same idea in that these fish were buried deep in the water uh, under lots of sediment and uh, there was no oxygen down there, no currents to disturb them, and so that's how these beautiful uh, examples are produced. Uh, you can purchase them, I mean they're, they're per made, uh, collected in many legal quarries, you can buy them on eBay, you know, all kinds of fossil companies that sell that sort of stuff. So as a, a sixth or last example of uh, original preservation, I'd say best for last, um, you might recognize some of this material. Uh, you may have jewelry made of this material. Uh, this is a fossilized tree sap we know as amber. Some of these are polished nicely so you can see it, if, if there's anything inside of them. But they look like when they come out of the ground, it's like that. Those are rough ones. They're not polished. So there could be some interesting things in there. Um, we'll show you a close-up of all these, but in particular we're going to take a look at this one right here. Uh, and from the picture you can see that it looks like a sort of a cricket or a grasshoppery sort of thing. And you'd be right if you thought so. Um, in fact, uh, I've taken pictures of all these specimens through microscopes and recorded their images in film. And here's an example of one of those. That's the cricket that's in there. About 35 million years old uh, from the Dominican Republic. Wyoming does have amber. It's uh, in the coal beds, it, like around Gillette and so forth. It's very crumbly and, and doesn't tend to contain a lot of beautiful specimens like this amber or the Baltic amber that's pretty famous that you may have heard of. Um, but that's pretty cool. I mean, you see the compound eyes and the antenna and all the, all the details of the creatures uh, perfectly preserved. Even their DNA is in there, but uh, although Jurassic Park's an interesting idea, uh, not very likely because uh, after that much time, the DNA just randomizes and loses all of its jet-coded genetic information. So, no, you can't build a dinosaur. Oh, well. Nice try.